Hello and welcome to lecture number six uh, in this new 2019 updated Drugs and Human Behavior set of lectures. Um, I will assume that you are familiar with the action potential in this lecture. Uh, if not, please go back and watch uh, my lecture on the action potential that's available uh, and posted to the course website. <clears throat> that comes from my physiological psychology class. Um, that is generally covered in intra psychology, so I'll assume you are familiar with uh, that and all of its processes. So, uh, for quick review, uh, based on that, the process by which neurons communicate is, of course, through neurotransmission and via the release of neurotransmitters. Uh, that process is something we'll get into more detail in. The action potential itself is how this process is propagated um, along the axon of a neuron in signaling those neurotransmitters to be released. So those neurotransmitters are released into the synapse, that is a narrow space between the terminal button of one neuron and the dendrite or dendritic spine of another. So the axon is always the transmitting end uh, of uh, neural communication and the dendrite is the receiving end. So here we have uh, a quick glance at that. We have an action potential reaching the axon terminal that then signals those vesicles to fuse uh, with the cellular membrane and release their contents into the synaptic cleft. Those then travel over to the receptor sites and then um, cause an effect on the uh, receiving neuron. As always, the axon is associated with the presynaptic neuron, the dendrite with the postsynaptic neuron. <coughs> Excuse me. We we'll spent some time talking about neurotransmitters. These are chemicals that are released by the presynaptic neuron. Of course, again, the action potential for quick review is that neural impulse in which an electrical charge travels down the axon of a, of a neuron, which causes the release of neurotransmitters. We won't get into all of the details of an action potential in this particular lecture. Again, take a look at the um, action potential lecture for all the details there. But suffice to say, um, what happens is we have the opening and closing of ion channels, which causes in the electrical charge of the uh, neuron, which causes that signal to travel the length of the axon and cause the release of neurotransmitters. Some properties about action potentials to remember, this is an all or none process. There's not a big action potential or a small action potential, they simply occur or don't. A neuron will fire if it is depolarized past its threshold. So, neurons exist in a state of uh, polarization, and so hyperpolarization uh, makes the charge uh, across the membrane more negative. Depolarization pushes it towards zero. Once that um, threshold of excitation occurs, that neuron will depolarize and will fire an action potential. This process of neurotransmission is stopped by several processes. Uh, reuptake, that is, there is a, a transporter protein on the axon terminal button uh, where those neurotransmitters are taken back into the presynaptic neuron. Uh, in the synaptic cleft itself are enzymes which will deactivate those neurotransmitters. And finally by autoreception, that is those neurotransmitters released will bind to the uh, membrane of the presynaptic neuron and stop it from continuing to release uh, further neurotransmitters. All of these processes uh, are influenced by psychotropic drugs and will become important throughout the term. So it's a nice summary. Uh, we have an action potential traveling down the axon. Uh, the neurotransmitters themselves are synthesized from chemical building blocks we call precursors. This can either occur in the axon terminal itself or uh, oftentimes in the um, cell body or soma. They're packaged in vesicles and then travel uh, down here to be released. So these neurotransmitters are stored in these vesicles. An action potential then causes those vesicles to fuse with the presynaptic membrane and release their contents into the synapse. So these release neurotransmitters bind with the postsynaptic receptors, and then this process is terminated by either reuptake back into there across uh, transporter proteins through autoreception, which um, causes the uh, release of those neurotransmitters to cease, and then of course by enzyme deactivation. So some neurotransmitters we're going to spend some time talking about throughout the term include acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is involved in memory and is also involved in uh, movement and motor coordination. Uh, serotonin is involved in mood regulation, sleep, appetite, and thirst satiety. Gamma, uh, gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA, is involved in sleep, 
and also uh, inhibits movement. It's an entirely inhibitory neurotransmitter. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter involved in memory formation and a variety of other um, events. Norepinephrine is primarily involved in arousal and mood. This is our primary stress hormone. Dopamine is involved in control of movement and also our sensation of pleasure and a variety of other um, issues. And then endorphins are involved in pain relief. So in general, um, we talk about the synthesis of neurotransmitters. This is how they're formed. Um, they're often precursors are the main ingredient that are brought to the neuron by uh, the bloodstream. Blood, the blood they're taken up by the cell body and or terminal. And these will usually come from substances in the diet. So oftentimes we talk about how your diet is going to regulate neurotransmitters. And in fact, when we get to depression, we're going to talk a great deal about how diet may have uh, be a particular risk factor for uh, depression. And so some of that has to do with these nutrition uh, issues uh, and trying to find the right building blocks for both neurotransmitters and other substances in the brain. So the um, enzymes in the cell itself will essentially assemble these. These are, of course, all accomplished via the um, instructions from the DNA within the cell itself. And so those proteins are formed uh, via transcription. And then we create and synthesize a variety of different neurotransmitters uh, in different uh, neurons. So these transmitters are then stored in uh, vesicles. That's to concentrate them to allow a release of a large number of them at the same time, but also to protect them from being uh, broken down by enzymes within the neuron itself. Enzymes are busy things, and they're constantly uh, transforming uh, one thing into another. And so those vesicles will protect the intact neurotransmitters from being broken down into uh, other substances. They are then released via exocytosis. Those vesicles will fuse with the presynaptic membrane and release those neurotransmitters into the synapse. Uh, they will then bind, that is, they will attach themselves to a receptor. And we'll talk a bit about um, how this process uh, works in a complete or partial manner when we start talking about uh, the pharmacodynamics of different drugs. So this binding of a transmitter to a receptor is what causes an effect. So it will attach itself to that receptor and cause uh, different effects depending on the type of neurotransmitter and the type of receptor. Um, so this process also can be affected by uh, various psychoactive drugs. So then uh, they are, the termination of synaptic transmission occurs uh, via metabolism. That is, they are broken down in the synapse via enzymes. So one of the main ones we'll talk about is acetylcholine, acetylcholine esterase and monoamine oxidase. Uh, these are both important uh, metabolic enzymes uh, that are targets for a variety of different drugs. Uh, reuptake uh, then occurs via the uh, process of transporter proteins taking the neurotransmitter back into the presynaptic cell. A lot of drugs target this process, and particularly we'll talk about ser selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, there is also reuptake by glial cells. This only occur occurs with glutamate. But the glutamate can be taken up by glial cells. And so here are some of the major actions uh, at the synapse. Again, we have the synthesis of smaller neurotransmitters. Um, here, the presynaptic terminal and action potential causes calcium to enter, releasing the neurotransmitter. These are what we call calcium-gated uh, ion channels. The neurotransmitter then can bind to the receptor. It can then separate from the receptors. It can be reuptake by a transporter protein. The postsynaptic style can also uh, release uh, retrograde transmitters that further slow this process. And then also negative feedback at those autoreceptor sites um, to the release of that neurotransmitter causes this process to stop. So again, another summary, you can take a look at this um, at home um, and pause and take a look at this closer. It's just simply another view of the same process. That gets us into talking about specific uh, neurotransmitter systems. We'll start with acetylcholine. It's one of the first to be recognized because it has significant peripheral, ac peripheral actions. Uh, it's also recognized later in brain tissue. We have a variety of different cholinergic receptors. We have what are called the nicotinic receptors and the muscarnic receptors. Uh, these are in uh, fairly different systems, uh, but they are contained uh, throughout both the body and the brain. Um, 
give you an idea, most of our uh, motor functions are controlled by uh, cholinergic receptors. And in fact, uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are an important part of understanding this process. So acetylcholinesterase is the uh, enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine in the synapse. Now, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, or what we call ACE inhibitors, uh, come in two different kinds, irreversible and reversible. The irreversible kind are generally toxic. These include things like pesticides and nerve gases. And what happens is because they're irreversible uh, inhibitors, we get a buildup of acetylcholine in the synapse. This can cause uh, muscle tension, muscle um, tremors, and then eventually will lead to cardiac arrest and respiratory arrest. Reversible ACE inhibitors uh, are thought to be cognitive enhancers. In fact, the uh, drug used to treat Alzheimer's dementia in the United States uh, is Aricept. And it is an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, which is marginally effective in treating some individuals with Alzheimer's type dementia. So the cholinergic system uh, is throughout the brain. So if we look here at this, these projections, uh, the diagram on the right, uh, this particular uh, cholinergic system is associated with learning and memory. Anticholinergic drugs such as scopolamine can cause certain types of am amnesia. So if you look, these uh, acetylcholine uh, projections sort of start uh, with both the hippocampus and the amygdala and then are transmitted throughout the uh, frontal lobes and cortex. The nicotinic receptors generally control skeletal muscles and the muscarnic receptors tend to control involuntary muscles. And so um, when we talk about these different kinds of receptors, uh, we generally talk about what they're controlling. Now there are also a number of nicotin nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the uh, hippocampus as well and nicotine affects a variety of different processes in the hippocampus as well. The catecholamines are the next general class of neurotransmitters. These are synthesized from tyrosine, which is a protein. These include dopamine and norepinephrine. These are terminated by reuptake and by monoamine oxidase inhibitors. These are both monoamines as well. Um, if you look over here on the right, you can see tyrosine is synthesized into dopa, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. These are what we call the monoamines, and so MAOIs, or monoamine oxidase inhibitors, can increase the synaptic availability of these particular neurotransmitters. And we'll talk about MAOIs more when we get to talking about antidepressant treatments. So norepinephrine is one of these um, catecholamines. Uh, axonal projections in the norepinephrine system uh, include uh, top-down control of the spinal cord where they exert an analgesic action. Uh, norepinephrine is the primary neurotransmitter released by the sympathetic nervous system. So when we have a sympathetic nervous system response, that is generally caused, uh, causes a uh, fairly significant release of, release of norepinephrine. So stress and stressful situations cause the release of this particular neurotransmitter. This produces an alerting, focusing, and orienting response. It also provides some feelings, positive feelings of reward. Dopamine is much more involved in our feelings of reward, but norepinephrine does as well. Dopamine pathways, uh, which we'll get into in a little bit more detail, include uh, hypothalamus to pituitary gland route, which controls uh, the release of a variety of hormones. From the substantia nigra to the basal ganglia, this is involved in our motor coordination, and in fact, Parkinson's disease is primarily a degradation of those dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra. The ventral tegmental area to cortex and limbic system is considered the reward pathway, and this is also often called the mesolimbocortical pathway. This is a significant part of what we call the reward pathway. And when we get to the um, lectures on the neuroscience of addiction, we'll spend a little bit of time talking in much more detail about this reward pathway. Serotonin is, of course, another important neurotransmitter. It is synthesized primarily from tryptophan. Uh, of course, this is the great lore that we get sleepy after Thanksgiving dinner because the tryptophan in turkey. It's actually not true. Most of it has to do with the fact that we just ate too much. In particular, we ate a lot of carbohydrates and fat. Um, 
There are a variety of different receptors you can actually see. There are seven different main categories of 5-HT receptors, including three subtypes of 5-HT1 and three subtypes of 5-HT2. They are all ionotropic. Um, and include, sorry, different pathways that largely par parallel the dopamine pathways. So if we take a look here, we can see fairly similar pathways um, exerting an up-down uh, or bottom-up projections into the cortex, but also some uh, other pathways involving the cerebellum and the RAFE nuclei. Glutamate is another um, excitatory neurotransmitter. It's actually the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. This comes from the metabolic pathway, that is via the Krebs cycle, or um, from glutamine via the uh, enzyme glutaminase. It binds to several different receptor types, including the NMDA receptor, which we'll talk more about, the kinate receptor, and the AMPA receptor. The NMDA receptor is mediated by glutamate and glycine serine. NMDA, the NMDA receptor requires uh, either membrane depolarization to have occurred already or by kinate or AMPA, so it does not work on its own. And the NMDA receptor is particularly involved in memory formation, so we'll spend some time talking about that as well because it is oftentimes affected by drugs such as benzodiazepines. So we also know epilepsy may be related to glutamate, um, and so we'll be talking a little bit about some anti-epilepsy drugs and their potential for other uses. Finally, when we get to talking about um, psychedelics, we'll talk about uh, PCP and ketamine as being glutamate antagonists, and we'll spend quite a bit of time when we get to talking about depression looking at ketamine as a new treatment for depression very different way of thinking about depression from our traditional role of thinking that it's just serotonin modulated. So if we look at the NMDA receptor itself, <clears throat> it has some very unusual characteristics. In addition to glutamate, another amino acid, such as glycine or serine, has to be present for this particular site to be activated. So they have to have glutamate, they also have to have the site have been uh, slightly depolarized, they seem to play a critical role in synaptic plasticity. I want to point out a couple of things about the NMDA receptor is there are a number of different sites which uh, can bind to this receptor and cause a variety of different effects. So there's a site where PCP can bind, there's a glutamate recognition site, there's a glycine site, a polyamine site, a zinc site, there's also um, benzodiazepine receptors and GABA receptors, so this is all fairly complicated. Um, type of receptor. It really has a lot of different things going on. Which gets us to GABA. GABA is a universally inhibitory transmitter. It's found in high, found in high concentrations in the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, GABA is made from glutamate under the control of the enzyme glutamate, glutam, uh, glutamic acid decarboxylase, or GAD. Um, it's metabolized by GABA transam transaminase or GABA-T. There are two receptor sites. GABA A and B. It's terminated uh, by reuptake with transporters on the neuron uh, itself or by a glial cell. Importantly, benzodiazepine sedatives are GABA agonists, and so we'll talk about how uh, benzodiazepines can actually facilitate the action of GABA by uh, assisting in the depolarization of the cell by opening chloride chains. So we have to keep in mind a lot of sort of basic first principles about neuroscience become particularly important in this kind of course. So GABA is uh, another important inhibitory neurotransmitter. Uh, alcohol also has effects on the GABA system. So you can see a um, variety of receptors, both the A and B, on the postsynaptic um, site, and uh, always universally inhibitory, this particular neurotransmitter. Peptides include small proteins or chains of amino acid molecules that are attached in sort of specific orders. These uh, have influences on things like opioid receptors, including the mu, delta, and kappa receptors, as well as the endorphins and the enkephalins. 
Nephilims. And these primarily modulate pain, breathing, uh, and a variety of other feelings of euphoria. In particular, uh, endogenous endorphins are those that are produced by us in the following things like exercise. Um, the feeling of endorphins is reinforced by uh, opioids as well. Substance B is also involved in the um, perception of pain and blocking substance uh, or having effects on substance P can influence pain perception as well. So those are the peptides. So here's a quick summary of neurotransmitter synthesis um, and uh, systems. We're going to talk more about different types of receptors, ionotropic versus metamotropic receptors, when we get to pharmacodynamics. So we have acetylcholine. Um, and then we have dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine uh, from phenylalanine and tyrosine, and then tryptophan um, gets modulated into serotonin. So that's a quick introduction to neurotransmitters uh, and the major neurotransmitter systems we'll be talking about this semester.